Greetings, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Bridget Cabrera. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action. We are so excited to be uh, continuing to co-host these webinars with our coalition partner, United Methodists for Kairos Response. Uh, MFSA is a national social justice nonprofit that mobilizes justice seeking people of faith to take action on issues of peace, poverty, and people's rights within the church, the nation, and the world. Um, just a few announcements for our time today. Um, again, continue to keep your videos off and your audio on mute so that we can hear from our speakers today. We are recording the webinar. That recording will be shared by UMKR and by MFSA. You, you will actually be added, if you aren't already, be added to our email list. So um, you will be emailed this information, um, the recording in the future, and you can also uh, access it through our websites. Um, we do ask that once we start, which we'll start in, in just a bit, that we um, refrain from using the chat and, and kind of reserve the chat just for questions for our speakers. So this will help us in fielding your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until we get to the Q&A portion of our time together to ask those questions. Um, as they come to you, feel free to type those into the chat, but let's reserve the chat for those questions. We're also offering closed captioning uh, for this webinar. You should um, be able to see that at the bottom of your screen, and if not, you can click show subtitles in order to view that. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, I will now turn this over to our moderator, Michelle. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Michelle dromgold Sermon, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and as a 2011 to 2013 United Methodist Mission intern, um, a 2015-2016 intern with United Methodist for Kairos Response and is a current PhD candidate in sociology specializing in immigration policy, displacement, and refugee resettlement. I'm honored to serve as the moderator for today's discussion. Um, United Methodist for Kairos Response was founded 10 years ago to help our denomination follow through on its commitments to human rights by divesting from companies and entities that support the occupation of Palestine. If you check out our, our website, kairosresponse.org, which is in the chat, you'll find that our work now includes producing educational materials, videos and webinars, promotion of authentic Holy Land travel with Mr. Manastra, one of our speakers is often involved, um, lobbying for federal legislation to protect Palestinian children, while at the same time opposing governmental restrictions on nonviolent economic action to achieve justice. Today in our webinar, we turn our focus to the unjust and destructive consequences of colonialism around the world, the consequences and evils of theft. To assess and understand modern day inequalities in the United States and around the globe, we must look to the past, for it is there that the roots of these inequalities reside. The systems of power and privilege that are in place today that benefit some and disenfranchise others are rooted in histories of theft and injustice. In considering colonialism's historical pattern of maintaining power among the powerful while subjugating and disenfranchising indigenous peoples, we must also consider its contemporary consequences we must ask ourselves, what do the powerful steal from the less powerful? How do they do it? Why do they do it? What are the consequences? And how is it justified by people who call themselves Christians? How can we meaningfully reject the sin of settler colonialism and support instead indigenous people's liberation struggles with the aim of achieving greater equality and equity around the globe? Today, we are pleased to have four distinguished speakers joining us to provide a glimpse into this issue around the world as we reflect on and grapple with these questions and consider both the historical and contemporary consequences of colonialism. Today, we'll be hearing from Reverend Elvin Deer, retired clergy in Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference with the United Methodist Church, Reverend Lloyd Nyarota, 
clergy in the Zimbabwe East Conference with the United Methodist Church, Reverend Armando Arellano, Filipino clergy in the East Ohio Conference, United Methodist Church, and Mr. Atamanastra, director of the Wadi Fukin Nargis Community Development Project, former mayor of Wadi Fukin, West Bank, Palestine. Thank you to each of you for taking the time to share your stories and perspectives with us gathered here today. Despite the breadth of this topic and your expertise, to leave time for questions and answers, each speaker will only have seven minutes to speak. So we hope that this will offer a glimpse into the global injustices um, that, that are experienced all around the world. First today, we'll hear from Reverend Deer, a full blood Native American of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma. He lives in Oklahoma City and recently retired from full-time ministry with the United Methodist Church after serving seven different local Native churches in Oklahoma. He serves on the board of the Native American International Caucus of the United Methodist Church and is a frequent speaker on Native American issues. With that, Reverend Deer, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak about an issue that I have grown up with all my life, and, and that uh, is historical trauma. Uh, Michelle mentioned that uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, I was raised by my Creek grandmother. Uh, we, our tribal name for ourselves is Muscogee. We're originally from Alabama and Georgia, and uh, we came over on the Trail of Tears where uh, over one fourth of our people died along the way. Um, I'm wearing this Native American ribbon shirt, not to show my Native Americanness, but to show the effects of colonization. Uh, I, uh, the ribbon shirt came from when our people were put in prisons back in the 1800s and they were given uh, prison uh, clothing and the Native American men did not want to wear that. So they uh, literally, I, nowadays we wear, we have cuffs uh, and uh, collars, but they tore the collars off and tore the cuffs off and made uh, ribbons out of them and turned their uh, prison shirt into something more like our traditional way uh, of, uh, uh, of dressing. So that's why I, I wear uh, this native uh, ribbon shirt, not, not again, just to show the effects of colonization. Uh, historical trauma, uh, like I said, I grew up with it. My grandmother told me so many stories of the Trail of Tears. Uh, uh, there are 39 tribes in Oklahoma, and 38 of them came from different uh, parts of the country. I saw in the chat where uh, people talked about the Kickapoo, the Potawatomi, the Lenape, the, uh, and we have those tribes in Oklahoma. Um, and so uh, if we can go to the next uh, uh, screen, um, historical trauma is a concept that uh, I guess originated with, an un with the uh, Holocaust survivors. And Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart uh, came across this and did a, an in-depth study for years on, uh, on historical trauma among Native Americans. Uh, and, and again, you see the screen, the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations. In, including the lifespan, which emanates from massive group trauma. I guess my heart hurts because uh, of, of the trauma I see of our people today, uh, which I've discovered is, is uh, uh, generational. And in the next screen, uh, we, we will see uh, the effects of colonization and, and uh, the, they brought diseases. I'm sure you heard about the smallpox uh, uh, blankets that were issued to Native Americans 
uh, alcohol. Um, the Dutch embassy in 2007 apologized to Native Americans for their, their bringing uh, alcohol to America. Of course, the enslavement, not only uh, in uh, the 1600s in, uh, in, in northeastern United States, but uh, California, the Catholics uh, enslaved so many of the tribes there. The religious indoctrination, the theft of our lands, and literally it was theft, although it was legal uh, thievery through uh, treaties and, and then the violation of the treaties. Theft of our children, and validation of our of our system and culture, uh, denying our history, uh, and and we were community, and and in the 1800s, America was developing this individualistic, and it became capitalism versus socialism, and and today even uh, Native people are uh, very strong in their extended families. I have so many uh, grandchildren, but they're my sisters and cousins' grandchildren, but they call me grandpa. Um, and, and so um, uh, these are the effects of uh, colonization. And the next screen will show you that um, um, what it happens today. Native Americans have the highest rates of suicide in America. And I was so devastated when I found out that uh, uh, Native teens have the highest suicide rate. And I couldn't understand why Native people would, would uh, young people want to kill themselves. Alcohol and drug abuse. Um, I, I, I drank heavily for many years and I've been clean now for almost 40. Uh, child abuse and neglect, loss of parenting skills. And that happened because of uh, taking our children and putting them in boarding schools and they didn't learn, uh, uh, you, you might say, how to be a parent. And, and the, the lateral violence in the form of domestic and sex, all of this, all of this is prevalent today. And we discovered uh, the, one of the reasons for it. And, and I would uh, uh, go to the next screen you have one minute left, Reverend dear. Okay, and we're almost through. Uh, the next screen, um, a sense of inferiority in one's culture uh, due to c colonial oppression and exploitation over the lifetime uh, uh, and generations. Uh, and, and another definition of turning upon ourselves, upon our families, upon our own people, the distress patterns that result from the oppression of the dominant society. And the last uh, 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 screen will show you, oh, uh, okay, uh, they're saying it's even uh, in our DNA. The next screen is what I'll end with. Uh, and that is how to heal. Uh, uh, and you can see this creative space for our own people to gather and talk. Historical trauma is like a form of PTSD. We don't know why we're angry, we have shame, we have uh, all of the uh, that. And, and it, once we learn that, we can begin to heal. Once we know the problem, we can begin to heal. Today, uh, the statistics are still high among Native Americans of alcohol, drug abuse, violence, and and, and all of that. So anyway, uh, that's, uh, we're, 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 we're hoping that this will give us an opportunity for us to learn how to heal. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Reverend Deer. Uh, second, we have with us Reverend Lloyd Niaroda, an ordained elder in the Zimbabwe East Conference, who currently serves as a pastor at St. John's United Anglican Church in Manning, Alberta, Canada. He has served as a consultant for the United Methodist Board of Church and Society and is very active with the African Central Conferences. With that, I hand it over to you. Okay.
thank you very much for for this time and um and i would like to thank the previous speaker um i do not have a slideshow because uh i, I mean uh, i just arrived uh like two days ago from zimbabwe where i spent more than a month i was back home and uh, now from soaking the african sun to try and survive the canadian winter <laughs> so i'm still kind of moving um when we talk about colonialism uh, in africa uh, colonialism was uh, kind of implemented and still continued uh, to uh, affect and impact uh, the African continent and people of uh, African descent in very different ways. The basis for colonialism is um, basically disrespecting humanity or taking away your human dignity. It first takes away your humanity, your UNU in my mother language, uh, where our southern neighbors in South Africa called Ubuntu in the Zulu. So it takes away your UNU and uh, makes you a subhuman, makes you substandard. You are not fully human. That's the basis of colonialism. Um, and therefore, you cannot make decisions. You cannot own or possess rights, uh, decisions, authority, uh, power. You have, uh, you cannot own or you can have, you cannot have title to anything um, and you are not entitled to anything. And this is how colonialism uh, un uh, unmasked itself in Africa. And uh, this kind of took uh, different levels. Uh, in Africa, that was carefully executed in phases. Uh, number one was to label the continent a dark continent, a uh, black uh, continent, which uh, there's nothing. So the image that was that is always created of Africa is nothing. Even if you look at, on the world map, you hardly believe that uh, United States, Canada, India, China, they all fit into Africa. But if you look on the map, Africa always looks tiny that trying that is a colonial process that is preparing the world's mind that this is a place that is so small and insignificant no matter that that's the biggest continent on the surface of the earth that can swallow two three other continents into it uh, but you see that is uh, basically to to portray that message to in the mind to colonize the mind colonize uh, the thinking uh, so, and then the next phase, that phase of laboring it, then the next phase was uh, capturing humans like natural resources to be exploited for economic development. So the people in Africa, because they had already been described as non-human and nothing, now they were like natural resources of the world. So Africa is a source of the world's natural resources for its development. So the, the human beings who were there, they were captured as uh, resources to be used for the development of Europe and the Americas. And we saw the trans-Atlantic uh, slave trade, uh, Europe and the Americas gaining its economic development from these world's natural resources. And because it has been projected that we are not humans, and the world has been projected and prepare itself that these are not human. Now came the, the animals and minerals, the hunters and explorers. So you see, when the world begin to say, no, we cannot continue, do, we cannot continue with this genocide of capturing human beings and use them as drought power or as anything, we all know the slavery thing, so I would move to the next. Now when we can no longer capture these human beings, now moved to the next next phase, which is um, capturing the animals, the wild animals, uh, mineral resources. And then we see the hunters and explorers coming into Africa to develop the mines, uh, hunting the elephants, uh, the hide and everything, 
and uh, the other natural resources. And then when that was exploited, and now we see the next phase is to occupy the space. Now the settlers are coming. And uh, that's where usually people try to think that's the beginning of colonialism. It is something that had started uh, centuries earlier. So now the space has been occupied and uh, now we have the settlers. I come from a country where we had the last fort of settlers hanging on, the Rhodesians and the Boers in South Africa. So the Rhodesians in Zimbabwe, the Boers in South Africa, they are settlers, they are now claiming this is our land, this is our place. And this is the same brand of Europeans who settle in Canada, in the United States, in South Africa, in Rhodesia, to disenfranchise natives and claim that this is our land. We are the owners and all those who are here, you are, this no longer belongs to you because you cannot be entitled to anything. And uh, one, minute Africa, remaining. one minute to go. Okay, then uh, comes the moment of control by development education systems that inculcates division among the native people. You are always divided. You are fighting against each other as the decolonization process was coming. Then uh, when the political decolonization happens, uh, then come the economic uh, colonial systems. And uh, the point I really would like to make is the next thing is destroy the indigenous people's religion and thinking and way of life. There is a very strong relationship between the European American politics and religion. So when all this that I've said was happening, religion was always uh, taking along. And we people of faith, we say, we say that what Christ did to that was to dismantle all that by he respected all human beings. He validated all people irrespective of who they were. He crossed the social, economic, spiritual, religious, and holiness barriers, kind of destroying all that and restoring human dignity. Thank you so much, Reverend Yarota. Um, right, you've given a, a, a comparison that's been very helpful. Uh, third, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. Armando Aureliana, uh, a United Methodist ordained elder and a member of the East Ohio Annual Conference. He currently serves the East Shore UMC in Euclid, Ohio. He was born and raised in the Philippines and is fluent both in English and Tagalog Filipino. He has served churches in the Philippines and in the United States. All right, thank you. I appreciate the words of wisdom from our previous speakers. Uh, thank you so much for that. And thank you for this opportunity that you have given me to uh, share about the, um, our experience back in the Philippines. Well, as you know, my name is Armando Aureliano, and right there is a colonial name. And when I became a US citizen, I was offered to change my name to a more Americanized name. So at the time, I was thinking of Harrison Ford, but uh, I decided not to. to keep, I decided to keep my name. Well, the Philippines is a victim of a habitual subjugation. 377 years of Spanish colonization. That's a lot of years. Two years of the British presence, 48 years of the American rule, and four years under the Japanese. So it's like uh, all generations somehow in the Philippines experience some kind of uh, form of colonization. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, the imperialism disguised in the uh, propagation of the uh, westernized Christianity using the name of God in vain. When Spain uh, reached the Philippines through uh, actually the leadership of 
Ferdinand Magellan, who was a Portuguese explorer. And since that time, it was claimed that the uh, group of islands of more than 7,000 islands um, was named and claimed after the King Philip II of Spain and to this day. So how about those centuries of colonization? Well, it brought a lot of distractions and exploitation and plundering of the natural resources to begin with. The uh, rape and abuse of the people and the land, the uh, displacement and disruption of inhabitants because of land grabbing. They were forced to leave their land. Demonizing the indigenous and natives way of life as if they were not acceptable and not the proper way to live as a human being. The uh, adulteration of culture and customs. Somehow they were disrupted and they were to a certain degree stopped the uh, practices. There was the uh, corruption of the minds, believing that colonizers are more superior than the locals. The uh, creation of local abusers and oppressors. What do I mean by that? They were the locals who were sanctioned by the uh, colonizers to stand and speak for the colonizers. They were local people who were trained to subjugate their fellow uh, natives. There was the unequal distribution of wealth and resources. So as long as you are loyal to the uh, uh, ruling parties, then you will get more resources and privileges. We also had the loss of national identity. And because somehow the Philippines with more than, say, like uh, around 200 at least uh, major, I'm sorry, 80 major dialects. And if you include the, um, um, what you call this tribal dialects, you're talking about 200 plus kind of groups there, at least. There was this uh, uh, created uh, low intensity and in regional conflicts among locals to weaken their resolve. No wonder to this day, uh, to some degree, we do not trust each other from people from different regions. So there was this dependency, the, the culture of dependency in terms of economic and uh, national security, as if we cannot do anything unless we depend on our former uh, colonizers. There was this um, a continuing uh, mentality of being a consumer mentality. And that's why, um, we, of course, from the uh, importing or getting the uh, raw materials, and then when it come back, it's already a finished product. So there was this uh, continuing consumer mentality instead of producers. And we also experienced the uh, re religious abuses, weaponizing the church, by institutionalizing and legitimizing structural racism as and Western supremacy, because both the Roman Catholic and the Protestant uh, churches experience the uh, institutionalized um, uh, racism, wherein the local priests at the time and pastors were still considered second class uh, workers. So to this, to this present time, Filipinos are in diaspora. I think there are about 11 to 12 million Filipinos living outside the United States. So what happened to the uh, labeling of, of colonized nations like the Philippines? You have one uh, minute remaining. Okay, thank you. So the Philippines, of course, to this day is being addressed as a third world country. A third world country? Well, because of uh, uh, being a colonized uh, nation, not in line with the uh, Western countries and, and the uh, uh, socialist uh, republic at the time, but to this day, it is offending, it is offensive, it is degrading, I mean degrading and subhuman to address a nation to this day 
as a third world nation. So I hope um, we could do something better and educate ourselves, most especially people from the uh, religious sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, finally, we will um, have Mr. Atam Manasra, who is director of the Wadi Fukin Nargis Community Development Project, which was established in partnership with the United Methodist Church in 2009. He is also the former mayor of Wadi Fukin, a small Palestinian village in the West Bank. Atta has been a tour guide in Palestine for many years, following a career as an English teacher and administrator. Mr. Manasra, I turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, this platform to talk about uh, our uh, community, our country, about ex our experience. I'm sure it's maybe familiar for, uh, if not for all of us, for majority of us, it's familiar the question and the story of our country, Palestine, and what's going on for many, many uh, decades. In fact, uh, it's known as uh, the longest occupation in the current uh, history. In, uh, of course, talking about uh, our case in seven minutes, not enough at all, but I'm going to talk about briefly about my own village, which can be like a microcosm of what's going on uh, all over Palestine. So what you see in green, this is a map of my own village. So the one to the left side, 1948, uh, which was the boundary or the area of Wadi Fukin, uh, it was about more than 5,000 acres of land. So just one year later, you see how the amount of land which was taken in 1949, then if you move uh, to 2014 and 2015, so you see that the green is going less and less until we don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, because this uh, process is going on and on. And uh, by the way, this is uh, Wadi Fukin from the name, it's an Aramaic name, meaning that uh, people who have been living in this place have been there not hundreds or, uh, but thousands of years. And uh, all the findings that we can come and see, we can see that things go back to maybe to the Stone Age, Bronze Age, and flimstones everywhere in the village. So in the next slide, it shows us where the location of Wadi Fukin, exactly where you see the arrow, and this black, sorry, the blue uh, circle, whatever, this is the huge settlement of Bitar Elite, which is in the eastern part of uh, Wadi Fukin, my village, as well as you see the red thing and the green line, this is the, like the borders with the state of Israel, and also showing uh, the green line. And the green line, it is uh, like uh, the agreement between the, the United Nations and all those who were involved in 1967 to mark the borders between uh, what is left of Palestine and with Israel, and which is known uh, nowadays as the borders between West Bank and Israel. And you see that uh, uh, Wadi Fukin is part of the huge, uh, or part of the Bethlehem district. And uh, it's, it's not clear, but you can see that how it's difficult for uh, Wadi Fukin people to go to the main town or the main city of Bethlehem, which is our uh, like window to the world. Well, I don't want to talk about all the problems that we face or uh, if you live in a, such a place in daily basis, how you can face all these huge buildings that blocking the sun from the east. I remember before this settlement has uh, been existed, we used to enjoy the early sunshine. But believe me, after that, you don't see the sun until maybe a half an hour after it comes up because 
the high buildings of this settlement are blocking even the sun from our uh, uh, neighborhoods and fields as well. Uh, so Wadi Fukin is a story that can be applicable for any place all over Palestine. That people who live there, they don't want anything, just dignity and secure their future for their children to come, for their generation to come. So the next slide, so if you keep going about the slides, and uh, you see this yellow sign, this is very uh, familiar to most of us. This means that this land is going to be confiscated. And you if you can see up the, the uh, in the back, uh, up at the horizon, you can see part of the buildings that belong to the settlement that I just mentioned. And you see also the Israeli soldiers who are installing these signs saying this land is going to be confiscated. This happened in 19, so, sorry, 2014. And the next slide also. Uh, okay, uh, this shows after that how land is taken, and uh, both is showing uh, the one to the uh, left side shows that this is a, a good farming land, and to the, the one to the right, it's afterwards how it was destroyed by the bulldozers that the soldiers brought to destroy and take and confiscate this land that belonged to the one of the farmers. And the smoke that you see, this is tear gas used against the owners of this land who come to question and do, to protect their trees and plants. Uh, okay, uh, just keep moving to the next slide. Uh, also this one minute left. Yeah, okay, so just keep going. This is also shows how the land is destroyed. And uh, so keep going about the slides. And uh, this is the Prime Minister Netanyahu that he came to Ad Fukin and he says all this land will be annexed to the settlement of Bitar Elite. And we move to the last slide. Uh, okay, uh, this is also one of our work with the global ministers and the, the playground soccer field to try to protect the land which is threatened to be confiscated. And the last slide shows the number of settlements all over West Bank, which are more or less. 300 and the uh, settlers more than 1 million and all you see that uh, all these purple things uh, uh, these are settlements all over Paris, uh, all over Palestine or West Bank and uh, the brownie are the what is left of the Palestinian land okay thank you very much thank you so much so as we have heard from all four of our speakers speaking about diverse places around the world, and yet there are similarities, right? There are similar threads. There's the exploitation and theft of lands, of children, of minerals, of animals, right, of people. And we have the demonization of indigenous ways of life, the alteration of customs, and the colonization of the mind with the introduction of new ways of life, um, the past is erased through colonialism. And there is both the darkening of places in thinking about places as third world, right? Or the darkening of Africa or the literal blocking of the sun in Palestine. And we then see, right, the manifestation of divisions, not only between colonizer and indigenous individuals, but also among Native people, um, fueling division to turn peoples against themselves. However, there's also hope for, um, for healing, right? And so we'd like to take your questions now um, that you have shared in the chat um, to consider all of these various aspects that have been touched upon today. So to start off, I'd like to start with a question um, about this idea of the colonization of the mind. Um, so I wondered if any of the four speakers would be, would be willing to offer um, an example. What sort of colonization of the mind happens in your context? Um, and how does this make indigenous individuals feel, right? Does it, does it force assimilation upon you? 
uh, among your people? Um, and how does this uh, reflect on your own self and true identity? Yes. Go ahead. Here. Um, when I, uh, I, I worked in the banking industry for many, many years. I'm an accountant by trade and uh, I worked with two Native Americans who uh, felt like to get ahead in the world, they had to marry uh, a Caucasian uh, lady to get ahead in the world. And uh, uh, I, I couldn't understand that mindset uh, because they felt like if they married a Native American woman that they would be always uh, oppressed and suppressed. And, and uh, that's something that just, I couldn't understand. Also, uh, one thing about names, um, my, uh, our, our people in 1886, the, the Dawes Act that, that uh, took away millions of acres from native tribes and they gave us 160 acres for us to live on at, per family. And when we were being enrolled for the Dawes Act to get the land, they were given out uh, Caucasian names. My, my great grandfather's name was Ijoe Mothali, which uh, Ijo means deer in the Creek tribe, and Imothali meant a leader. And, and so they, they gave him the name of Thomas Riley. And he uh, objected vehemently so they asked him what his uh, Indian name meant, and he told him uh, a, a leader of, of the Deer Clan, actually. And, and uh, so they gave him the name uh, Thomas Deer. Otherwise, I would be coming to you today as Alvin Riley. Uh, and I'm thankful that my great grandfather uh, wanted to keep our tribal name. That's great. Thank you. All right. And that also speaks to um, what Reverend Dr. Arleano uh, spoke about with his own name as well. Does, do any of the other speakers have examples of this sort of colonization of the mind that comes to mind? If not, we'll move to another question. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the education system uh, from school was also set in a colonial setup where, um, you know, you are divided from elementary, you are categorized and put in classes to create that class system that did not uh, kind of exist in our culture. Uh, and this was also filtered through Sunday school classes in, in schools, uh, Sunday school. And, you know, when you are baptized, when you have your name as Chayenda, which is my name uh, at birth, when you are baptized, back then you were supposed to get a Christian name and uh, some of the names now when you read you say how how is George a Christian name uh, how is this a Christian name but because it is an European English name therefore it's Christian because you have a Shona native name therefore it, it's hidden so that's uh, and then it takes time to take that out of the mind that everything Western is what is Christian, everything African is what is hidden. So, and then it creates that. So to go in a process of decolonizing that process, it takes a long time. And it, it is passed on generation to generation because it is what is Western that is seen as development, education, um, class and everything. Can I say something? Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, for me, the way I understood the uh, colonization of the mind, it leads to a low uh, self-esteem right. and a psychological inferiority complex that also leads to a low productivity. And then um, I think that's uh, so a lot of people probably uh, like from the Philippines still suffering uh from that kind of uh uh colonization of the mind thank you 
Uh, may okay. I add something? Of course. Okay, uh, maybe here it's a little bit more complicated and because we have all sorts of colonization in, in here. So I choose uh, to have this kofiya in the presentation because it was uh, a crime and sometimes to, to hear your, your kofiya uh, by the occupation here. Uh, so it's more than just uh, uh, minds. It's also expressing yourself or talking about your story or whatever. It was forbidden. It was not allowed. Even uh, going to your fields or uh, preserving your culture. So more on one, this is what we have all the time in here. Thank you all for sharing those examples. Um, before we close for the day, let's perhaps turn to some questions of hope and healing, right? We, we have this trauma. Um, and so there's a number of questions sort of surrounding these sorts of um, questions. So I'd ask the speakers to speak to these. Um, so for example, what examples could you give um, for us about how we can all be better advocates and allies. Um, how can members of different faith communities approach justice in Palestine or in other communities as a spiritual journey, right? So how can our faith and our religion, rather than being a destructive force, how can it be a source of healing and of resilience? May I start? Yeah, of course. Okay, thanks for this question because I don't want to forget to say big to get to send big hug for our all our friends of Wadi Fukin who are maybe some of them are listening to us and uh, most of them are uh, from California all over the United States friends of Wadi Fukin who have been supporting us and this is a kind of hope that we are looking for and they are doing very well. And I hope that I could have more time to show the slides about uh, some things that they have been doing in Wadi Fukin, such as the soccer field, that we were all the time needing, needing that. But it's not the reason for the soccer field, but when it was constructed there by the help of the United Methodist Church and the Friends of Wadi Fukin, so we were able to preserve that land and it becomes a kind of hope for our uh, children who enjoy being there and it, it, uh, it gets a kind of solidarity and we know that there is always something good in this world, not only evil. And uh, so I really am grateful to all those who are helping us uh, from the United States, mainly we call them Friends of Wadi Fukin and you can Google and you can uh, find them easily. Thank you. And I'm really grateful to mention some names like Michael Yoshi and Mike Frederick, uh, Jen Hart, uh, and all those names that really, uh, they are all very important for us. They are our heroes. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Well, I, I would say first, I have been serving churches in the United States for about 26 years. And all of them are cross-racial and cross-cultural uh, uh, appointments or settings. So um, I think we can move on from, and by the way, I thank those congregations who embrace us and um, who accepted us as their pastor. So we can move on from colonization, militarization, and subjugation to a global based on mutual partnership, partnership and bilateral cooperation. Dismantling the oppressive structure that only favors and benefits the rich and the powerful, and that includes the church. We need to look at the model of Jesus the one who empowers the weak, the poor, and the oppressed. This is the authentic gospel of Christ, the Christ of Nazareth, Galilee, and from different places. 
So yeah, I mean, we need to have a, a, a baby step in order to uh, correct the, uh, the sins of the past and repentance is a good gesture to begin with and, and uh, only accepting and taking ownership of the uh, abuses of the abuses that colonizers had um, inflicted to the uh, inhabitants or occupied uh, communities. Great, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would add something to that, like um, there's need to yeah. have the- um, It's even been great for bringing- Okay. The, the, okay. Yeah. They, they need to have respectful dialogue, and uh, those who have power, who have imposed this colonial thinking mentality, and subjugated other groups for years, needs to stop using the power they accumulated in the process to manipulate um, uh, the, the other people. So I mean, like as I presented on the how Africa faced the colonialism from uh, forced the removal of people and resources and all that and all that. That is kind of uh, uh, let that continent kind of having no time to, to develop because it was impacted. And in the process, others were accumulating power, accumulating resources. That is economic, social, political power that has been accumulated. Now, when we say let's have respectful dialogue, I think it is important for our brothers and sisters in the Europe and Americas to understand that they are wielding that power that they accumulated through colonialism. And that power can be economic, can be whatever form of power, can be political. And that is what I have seen, that power being abused, that power being used to keep those who lost the power through colonial programs. Now, even if we say, let's stop, there is no equal dialogue. There's no respectful dialogue. There's no, I mean, so I think that is something very critical, especially for the church to understand that. Thank you. One quick thing. Uh, we have used the term colonizers uh, hundreds of times in this, uh, in this discussion, and um, uh, we really haven't talked about the uh, effects of the doctrine of discovery that uh, Christianity is more or less founded on uh, to justify their colonization of indigenous lands worldwide. And um, it, it's, their, it's their free pass to go into any country and take it in the name of, of uh, Christianity. I won't say in the name of Jesus Christ, but in the name of Christianity. And uh, uh, we do need to uh, uh, look at that as a, uh, as a flawed and failed kind of uh, um, doctrine for uh, Christianity to still hang on to. That's great. Thank you, Reverend Deer, for sharing that. Um, and I do believe that um, there is a, a possibility of having a subsequent webinar later on down the road about the doctrine of discovery. So that may be a topic that we all explore together more in depth later on, um, because right, colonialism is, is big enough on its own. We don't want to add another big, big one to uh, the topic. Um, so we're almost out of time for today, um, but what I, I just want to sort of wrap up with what we see as the, the different things that are being brought forth by our speakers, right? We can think about colonialism as like a very much an institutional force, the way that institutions have come in, right? Um, different nations have come in and shaped countries, right? Disenfranchised individuals, but they're also, we're all individuals as a part of this puzzle. And so in thinking towards the future, right, we can think about um, acts of repentance, acts of um, accepting and taking ownership for the abuses that were caused, um, but also wielding the power and the resources that, that we 
who are powerful have and giving back in ways that we can to support um, programs like the soccer field in Wadi Fukin um, and to consider those as well. Um, I did want to, someone had asked a question about the impact of COVID on um, indigenous communities specifically in the United States for Re Reverend Deer, but I wanted to know if um, the COVID pandemic was, was having a um, impact on other communities as well. So perhaps Reverend Deer, you could speak to that first. Uh, we, uh, as Native Americans, are very concerned about the uh, high impact that is having on the uh, Navajo reservation. Um, uh, the Navajo tribe is the largest Indian tribe in, in America, and uh, the, the, the devastation among our Diné people is, is very, uh, very high and it's very uh, unsettling. I don't know uh, what they're doing to uh, the, either the, the tribe or the states of Arizona and New Mexico are doing to try and, and uh, bring that down. Here in Oklahoma, uh, uh, almost 10% of the uh, COVID cases are Native American, and we uh, we don't make up 10% uh, of uh, uh, of the state. So it's it's uh, very very uh, unsettling. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think one thing we can think about, right, is even the ways in which vaccine distribution, healthcare facilities are a function of this colonial structure that we've been talking about, right? Who is even getting today's modern resources um, is still at play there. So we are unfortunately out of time for today, um, but we I would like to thank you all for for attending and we will right, so people will stick around for a little bit afterwards. So if you want to connect over the chat with individuals, um, that opportunity is available. Um, and I do want to make you all aware of our next MFSA UMKR webinar, which will be held on Wednesday, March 10th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And the topic will be on apartheid. Uh, so another big topic. Um, and I invite you to watch for more information um, on that will be on its way. So thank you all so much and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.